Hi, I'm Laurel, and in this problem, we will be discretizing an information system using discernibility formulas. Let's work this problem together. This system has tuples labeled X, two attributes labeled A and B, and a decision feature D. We have seven records labeled 1 through 7. Attribute A has three possible values, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.7. Attribute B has four values, 1 through 4 and the decision feature D, which can be either 0 or 1. When we discretize our data set, we reduce the number of distinct values in the attributes. One of the ways we do this is by combining discrete values. For example, we can take 0 0.2 and 0 0.5 in attribute A and merge them into a single value. However, when we do this, we must be careful not to make two tuples with different decision features indiscernible. It is important that we don't make two tuples with different decision features have the same values for the conditional attributes. Let's move on with our example. Our system has two conditional attributes, A and B. Let's start with A. Attribute A has three values, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.7. What we do is create cut points, or rather, places where we might choose to merge or not merge the two values. So in this case, 0 0.2 and 0 0.5 might be merged into a single value. When we use this algorithm, we choose our split points based on which ones will give us the fewest number of values and allow all of the tuples to keep their distinctiveness. We place split point P1 between values 0 0.2 and 0 0.5 in attribute A, and we place split point P2 between values 0 0.5 and 0 0.7. We also need to set the split points for attribute B. Attribute B has four values and three split points. We place split point Q1 between values 1 and 2 in attribute B. We place split point Q2 between 2 and 3. We place split point Q3 between 3 and 4. The next step is to create our discernibility statements. We compare every tuple to every other tuple that has a different decision feature. We list the cut points that are needed to keep the two tuples distinct from one another. It is important when choosing our cut points that we do not make two tuples indiscernible. First, let's compare tuples one and two. They have a different decision feature and they differ on attributes A and B. In order for the two tuples to remain distinct, we need to have different values for 0 0.2 and 0 0.5, or different values for 1 and 2. Once we have listed all of the necessary splits, we can use them to create a discernibility formula. Let's look at what splits are needed to keep tuple X1 distinct from X5. Tuple 1 has the same decision feature as tuples 3 and 4, so we do not need to worry about keeping them distinct. In order to prevent an indiscernibility relationship, split P1 needs to be present. Let's move on to the next set of tuples. Now let's look at tuples 1 and 6. In order for the two tuples to remain distinct from one another, we need to have splits on either P1 or Q2. We do not need to compare tuples 1 and 7, so we can move on to comparing tuples 2 and 3. Notice that on this one, we can use P1 or Q1 or Q2. Any of those three will work. We can choose to split on either P1 or Q1 or Q2, because what matters is that there is a split, not where it is. Of course, we do not need all of the split points, and so as we move further through the system, we will choose the best ones. When we compare tuples 2 and 4, we see that we need to have splits on P2 or Q1 or Q2 or Q3. Now we can compare tuples 2 and 7. They only differ on attribute A and need splitting point P1 to be present in order for them to remain distinct. Let's move on to tuples 3 and 5. As you can see, we need splitting points P1 and Q2 to be present in order for the two tuples to remain distinct from each other. Now we can move on to comparing tuples 3 and 6, 
And as we can see, we need P1 to be present in order to not create an indiscernibility between 3 and 6. We move on to comparing 4 and 5. And when we look at 4 and 5, we see that we need there to be splits on either P2, Q2, or Q3 in order to prevent them from becoming indiscernible. I'm going to speed up a bit on these last few. Let's look at 4 and 6. As we can see when we look at 4 and 6, we need there to be splits on either P2 or Q3. And if we look at 5 and 7, we see that there need to be splits on either P1 or Q1. Now that we've finished with 5 and 7, we can move on to our last set, 6 and 7. We need there to be splits on either P1, Q1, or Q2. Now that we have listed which split points we need in order to keep each tuple distinct, we pick which ones are the best to use. We want our attributes to have as few distinct values as possible. This algorithm uses heuristics to determine the best splits to use. Let's walk through how that works. We start by looking at what cut points are needed to keep 1 and 2 distinct from one another. In this case, we need either P1 or Q1 to be present in order for this to work. To make it all a bit easier to understand, I'm writing it out on the screen in Boolean form. The notation on the screen reads that P1 or Q1 need to be present, or as I tend to say, true, in order to keep your tuples distinct. Along with the values to keep 1 and 2 distinct from each other, you also need the values to keep 1 and 5 distinct from each other. In this case, that single value is P1, so we need P1 or Q1 to be true, and we need P1 to be true. Now we need to add the values to keep 1 and 6 distinct from each other. In this case, P1 or Q2 need to be true in order to keep 1 and 6 distinct from one another. We continue following this algorithm with the other pairs of tuples. Next, we can look at what we need to keep 2 and 3 distinct from each other. In this case, P1 or Q1 or Q2. And then we add to that what's needed to keep 2 and 4 distinct from each other, P2 or Q1 or Q2 or Q3. Continue by adding what's needed to keep 2 and 7 distinct, which is only P1. Since we already know that P1 needs to be true because of tuples 1 and 5, I'm not writing it up there again. Now we move on to keeping 3 and 5 distinct from one another, which requires P1 or Q2. As before, P1 or Q2 is already required because of an earlier pair, so I'm not writing it again. I'm going to speed up a bit with these last few groups. You might consider pausing the video and writing these out yourself on your own page. Restart it when you're done. Or if you prefer, I'll continue writing them up on the screen. So we need P1 or Q1 to be true, and P1 to be true, and P1 or Q2 to be true, and P1 or Q1 or Q2 to be true, and P2 or Q1 or Q2 or Q3 to be true, and P2 or Q2 or Q3 to be true, and P2 or Q3. Don't lose sight of the meaning here. Remember, when we say that P1 must be true, what that actually means is that we cannot merge in attribute A, 0.2 and 0.5 into a single value. They need to remain distinct to keep from creating indiscernible tuples. Speaking of P1, P1 must be true. As you can see, tuples 1 and 5 become indiscernible unless P1 is present. Since we want to make certain we don't create any indiscernibility, P1 has to be true. Then we check other pairs for P1. Tuples 1 and 2 require P1 or Q1 to be true. Since P1 is already satisfied, that takes care of 1 and 2. 
1 and 5 requires only P1 to be true. Well, we've already set P1 to be true. Remember, we need to satisfy all the pairs. Now let's look at 1 and 6. P1 or Q2 need to be true to satisfy 1 and 6. We already have P1. 2 and 3 require P1 or Q1 or Q2 to be true in order to satisfy it. We already have P1. However, look at 2 and 4. It requires P2 or Q1 or Q2 or Q3, not P1, so it's not satisfied. 2 and 7 requires P1, so it's fully satisfied. 3 and 5 requires P1 or Q2, P1 satisfies it, as does 3 and 6, which only requires P1. 4 and 5 is not satisfied because it needs P2 or Q2 or Q3. 4 and 6 is not satisfied because it requires P2 or Q3. However, 5 and 7 is satisfied because it requires P1 or Q1. 7 requires P1 or Q1 or Q2 in order to be satisfied. As you can see, P1 alone satisfies many of our pairs. It fulfills P1 or Q1, P1 or Q2, and it fulfills P1 or Q1 or Q2. Now we need to pick our next value. If there were another single value, I would use that, but since there isn't, we count. We see how many instances of each remaining value appear. This tells us which one will fulfill the most conditions. Remember, we want to pick as few values as possible. Tuples 1 and 2, 1 and 5, and 1 and 6 are all satisfied by P1. Tuples 2 and 3 and 2 and 7 are satisfied by P1. However, 2 and 4 is not satisfied. So, we count a single instance of P2, a single instance of Q1, a single instance of Q2, and a single instance of Q3. Keep going! We also have unsatisfied values in 4 and 5. We add another instance of P2, bringing us to 2, another instance of Q2, bringing us to 2, and one of Q3. 4 and 6 is still unsatisfied, and so we add instances of P2 and Q3. Now we have 3 P2 and 3 Q3. So we pick the most common value and test it to see whether it satisfies all of our pairs. In this case, P2 and Q3 would work. They will both give the same result. For the sake of demonstration in this video, I'm going to show both options. 1 and 2, 1 and 5, and 1 and 6 were already satisfied by P1. 2 and 3 was satisfied by P1. 2 and 4 would be satisfied by P2 or Q3. And 2 and 7 was already satisfied by P1. 3 and 5 was already satisfied by P1, as was 3 and 6. 4 and 5 would be satisfied by P2 or Q3. 4 and 6 is satisfied by P2 or Q3. 5 and 7 was already satisfied by P1, as was 6 and 7. So that means if we pick either P2 or Q3, all of our remaining conditions are satisfied, and we don't have any indiscernible tuples with different decision features. If this didn't satisfy all of our conditions, we would repeat. We would continue looking at pairs of unsatisfied tuples and counting instances of our split points. Then we would pick the most frequently appearing one and apply it. So, in conclusion, in order to satisfy all of our pairs, we need P1 and either P2 or Q3 to be true. To wrap up, I'm going to show what it looks like when you apply this discretization. Remember our original data set with all those discrete values? And remember what P1, P2, and all that really means? Essentially, by picking P1, we're stating that 0.2 and 0.5 in A cannot be replaced by the same value or be combined into a single value. Here's what the data set looks like when we apply P1 and P2. This is a good place to pause the video and take a look at the data set. One thing that's important to notice is that there are no places where two tuples have different values for D 
but the same A and B values. Lastly, let's look at that same data set after applying P1 and Q3. As you can see, same as the other example, there are no indiscernible tuples. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and check my channel for my other algorithm videos.